Hey there, digital world. How you going? Like for real, how is everyone going out there? I hope you're doing okay. It is, it is, it is quite some, some world that we live in at the moment. It's very stressful time. I hope everybody is keeping it together, not panicking, looking after oneself, doing everything that the health and news and everything else is telling us to do to survive the a coming apocalypse. No, no, not really. It's not an apocalypse. It's just things are a bit cuckoo pajamas at the moment. And I really hope that everyone listening is just, just hanging in there and doing okay. If you recall last week, I promised that starting from this week onwards, I was going to get back to the movie theater and review some movies. That's not going to happen. Not for a while from the looks of it. Not safe. Too scared to go outside. We all got to stay inside. We have to self-isolate. We have to not pass on diseases. We have to try and remain healthy. But hey, let's push on, right? Social distancing. That means you stay inside. What are you going to do? Why not listen to a podcast? And I'm here to give it to you. I also promised last week that I'd be giving you a top 10, and by golly, I'm going to do it, and hopefully you will enjoy it. Now, when we get to the end of the year, it's hard to say. I think my top 10 movies of 2020 might be a bit difficult, depending what I'm actually able to see before the end of the year. I mean, fingers crossed, things get a little better. But hey, why don't we go back in time and do a top 10 from a year that wasn't plagued with disease, fire, war, death taxes, anything like that. Why don't we go back in time and have a look at my top 10 movies of that lovely year, 2017. I've done a few top 10 movies going back. We did 2018, then we did 2019, because that was the year that was ending. 2017 was a pretty good year. I saw a lot of movies in 2017. I've seen a lot of movies since then. And I can honestly say that this list that I'm about to present to you is way different than the list that I originally had at the end of 2017 and we're going to come into that more and more as we go further and further back in the years because i just see more and more stuff more opportunities to see things that slip by me and to appreciate that there are some movies that are just amazing that i never think of to go and see because i'm so zoned in on seeing the 27th marvel movie or the next sequel to spongebob squarepants or something like that so let's get right into it because these Rankings always take a little while to get for everything. We don't drag it on for too long. But of course, some quick parameters before we begin. The first one being that this is my list, which means it is completely biased and not at all correct to how probably most of the people listening will think their list is. There's going to be movies on here that aren't critically acclaimed. There's going to be movies on here that people might think are a bit cheesy, predictable, by the numbers. Some might even hate these movies. If you do, you're totally allowed to do that. But don't be upset that my list doesn't reflect your list. Feel free to let me know what your list is. Feel free to or tell me what other movies out there that I don't mention, even in the honorable mentions, that I should be worth seeing. Absolutely. Just have fun listening to the movies, seeing if you like them, seeing if you don't. We're all here to just have fun. As I've said before, this list is not complete of every movie that came out in 2017. I haven't seen everything. I'm sure there's a movie out there that's just fantastic. I haven't seen yet. So it's just going to be what I see. I can't hear a movie's good and put it on the list. I limit this movie to theatrical releases. So unfortunately, director DVD movies are out, streaming movies are out, not because they're bad, but just because it's easier to make the list if I don't have 5,000 things to pull from. Cool. That's our usual parameters. We get them out of the way before Andrea top 10 list. Let's power on right into it. My top 10 movies of 2017. Coming in at number 10. We all need this one. I'm sure you do. There were trailers for it in front of every movie before it came out. There was a big countdown for it. Singing, dancing, the loveliest guy in the world in it. That's right, I'm talking about The Greatest Showman. I love The Greatest Showman, mainly because I love musicals. Number one, I think musicals are just an absolute treat to watch. They are completely uplifting. They really make your spirit soar. You can jazz along with the music. If it's positive, if it's a negative, it can really make you hurt in your core in a good way. No one ever watches a musical and gets bored, I would hope. If you are, I don't know, maybe you don't have a soul, it's hard to say. And second of all, boy do I love Hugh Jackman, both as an actor and as a person in real life. Hugh Jackman, of course, comes from Australia, where I hail from, as I'm sure all of my listeners 
to hail from, but if you are listening to me in a different country, you should know that Hugh's great. If I could aspire to be any actor in the business, I think I would be Hugh Jackman. I mean, we even share the same birthday. That's insane. We may as well be twins. If you're listening, Hugh, please invite me to the next Oscars because we are brothers. The Greatest Showman tells the tale of P.T. Barnum, who grows up in Victorian England, bit of a nobody, wants to be big, wants to be recognized, wants to be famous. But of course, he never gets a chance, has a lovely family, that's great, but he can't see past the good that's in front of him. He wants to see what it's like to live among the stars. And he manages to do that by using other people's quirkiness. In the movie, they're called freaks, but they're not freaks, they're just unusual. You've got the bearded lady that can sing, the acrobats, elephant man, a little person that can ride a horse, the whole bunch, whole things, which back in that time, people would go, oh my god, how unusual and spooky. We don't like that, but we will pay to watch it. Of course, as they get famous and bigger, Barnum gets swept up in the popularity, he begets about his family and the people that got him there in the stardom in the first place and it's basically just him coming to terms with the fact that it is great to be recognized and it is great to be remembered but not at the expense of losing the people who loved you and cherished you before you were big time sounds like you've heard this story before yeah probably i've been told before that this movie has been done a thousand times in a thousand different ways i've been told before that pt barnum was a jerk in real life and he was nothing like what he is in the movies I've been told that the story is predictable. I've even been told that the songs aren't as great as songs in other musicals. Everybody's entitled to their opinion. And I can't argue with how P.T. Barnum was in real life. However, as a movie, and I can guarantee you this movie in no way tries to tell you that this is a true event. It's just fun. It is absolute fun, pure escapism. I've had many a conversation with people at work, at home, at the karaoke bar, all just going nuts for the music in this. Of course, my favourite being This Is Me. I'm sure you will have heard This Is Me. It would have been all over the radio when The Greatest Showman came out at the end of 2017. Nominated for an Academy Award for Best Original Song. It is a great song, truly powerful, uplifting. The woman who sings it, I think her name is Kiala Settle, but I've probably said it wrong, so I apologise. But the emotion she puts into the song, both in the movie, when she does the performance, when she finally belts out the song, but also in subsequent performances. You can see she truly believes in the song that she's singing and that it is really personal to her as a person. The fact that her voice nearly breaks at the high note every time because she's so emotional is just absolutely amazing to watch. Hugh Jackman is also just so likeable as P.T. Barnum, even when he's being an absolute dickhead, because he's just got that swagger about him, that, that charm that I think he really pulls from being Hugh Jackman, the loveliest guy in the world in real life. The reason why I love The Greatest Showman overall is just it is such an uplifting movie for me. It really set the standard for me for what I wanted to do with my life. Watching it, I could say I have done none of the things I set myself as goals after watching this movie, but I was inspired. I felt that there was a way that I could achieve anything watching this movie. I listen to the songs over and over again when I drive to and from work. I sing them at karaoke parties. It's just a really lovely movie, and I that's there's not enough of these movies in the world. I think that's just a good time. No ulterior motives, no responsibilities, just sing a song, have some fun. And that is why, regardless of every movie that I ever see that I learn comes from 2017, The Greatest Showman still locks itself in on that list. It will never move from number 10. Coming in at number 9 is a lovely little film, which you'd have to be a demon to not appreciate this film and the characters that is in this film. I am of course talking about Paddington 2. If you're unfamiliar with Paddington, it's very simple. Paddington is a bear. Came from darkest Peru, which is somewhere. Ended up at Paddington Station, met a lovely little family called the Browns, who adopted him. I'm essentially summing up the first movie because that's really what happened in Paddington. Paddington gets his usual traits. He gets his love of marmalade. He wears his little blue jacket and his red hat. Usual standard family film Paddington. Paddington is great, but what makes Paddington 2 so special? It is just such a it's lightning in a bottle, this film, in terms of the story that it tells and using all the characters so strategically and usefully. There's not a single character in this movie that feels like it's in here for no reason at all. What makes the movie is Paddington. His just lovableness, his cuteness. He's voiced by Ben Whishaw. 
and there is a wonder to Paddington that is just delightful. Even when you see him with a shearer just absolutely destroy someone's haircut, you say, good job, Paddington, well done. That guy's wrong for not liking the haircut. That's how just lovely Paddington is. In this film, Paddington, he wants to send a, a gift to his aunt back in Peru. He wants a specific book, which just showcases London, because his aunt really wants to go to London, but never has. So he goes to do that, through a series of events, he ends up in prison. And in true paddington he has to find his way out. Now, the highlights for this film is Paddington in prison, and somehow, with the roughest, toughest, hardest criminals of all time, led by Brendan Gleeson, who plays Mad-Eye Moody in Harry Potter, he makes them all one big happy family for his love of marmalade, to a point where these prisoners would die for Paddington. Furthermore, our villain of the movie is played by Hugh Grant. Now, I never thought much of Hugh Grant. Not that I didn't not like him or care. He just was that guy that was in Love Actually that I hadn't seen at this point yet and was in a lot of romance movies. Well, I've seen Hugh Grant in a lot of things since then. Not just this, but The Gentleman and The Man from Uncle and his ability to embrace the wacky goofiness of the characters that he's been doing recently is an absolute delight. In Paddington 2, he is a failed actor that's after some special treasure that's connected to the book that Paddington wants. So he frames Paddington to get the book, and then he goes on his own little quest. Once he puts Paddington in prison, he doesn't really interact with Paddington again. He's just off trying to trying to find his gold. And the things he's doing, as he's a previous actor, he's got these personas that he puts on these mannequins, and he interacts with them when he's planning his villainous plans. Hilarious. Absolutely incredible. Hugh Grant showing off that he can be a pirate, a crossdresser, a leprechaun, all these different things. As with The Greatest Showman, but I think more so with Paddington, this movie is just a lovely little film that requires nothing from you than just to have a good time. No ulterior motives. It's just sweet. Paddington fills my heart with joy every time I watch him. His connection with his family, Mr. Brown, Mrs. Brown, the kids, the nanny, the grumpy-ass neighbor that lives nearby, all his neighbors who he manages to bring together in just remarkable different ways. It's just so adorable, and the fact that they all come together to help him when he needs them is just great. Paddington 2, I don't want to oversell it too much because I know the whole world just says Paddington 2 is great. If you haven't seen Paddington 2, you truly are missing out on just an absolute lovely heartwarming film. If you're stuck inside with the whole self-isolation quarantine thing, and you haven't seen this movie and you're in need of uplifting, this movie is guaranteed to do it. I love Paddington 2, number 9. Number 8. Everybody loves this film. Academy loved this film. I love this film. Why? Because it's just incredible. It is The Shape of Water. I think you'd probably hear of Shape of Water. There was a big buzz about it for maybe the wrong reasons. There was a lot of talk about the underwater sex scene between a woman and a fish. That's in here, but there's so much more to this movie than that. It is directed by Guillermo del Toro, who is one of my favorite directors. He's done a lot of the the darker, horror-y stuff, but not going into the horror realm that I hate, which is the jump scares. He does horror with a story. He scares you or creeps you out through the experiences that you have watching things unfold. He's not out there just to boo you into thinking you're scared. But he also doesn't do horror films as well. He does the films that have the darkness, but he makes a specific story out of them, whether he's doing the old Hellboy movies, Blade 2, or in this case, The Shape of Water. What it's basically about is that this science facility has acquired this specimen, this fish-like creature. We don't really learn where he's come from or what he is, because that's not the point of the story. The point of the story is that he forms a relationship with this poor, uh, mute cleaning lady who works at the place that he's being held. She is quiet, she's meek, she's stepped on by all the people around her, she's very emotionally distraught, not much going for her in the life in her life, but the relationship that she forms with this fish creature, just through no word, they don't speak to each other. She's mute, obviously, and he's a fish. But the way they form the relationship together is so believable, which is a testament to the actress Sally Hawkins, who was also in Paddington too, I might add. How great's that? And the actor of the fish man, Doug Jones. They convey so much emotion through just looking at each other, placing their hands on the glass. It's also supported by a wonderful supporting cast that either make you love humanity or hate it. Whether you love it through Octavia Spencer, 
or Richard Jenkins who are supporting Sally Hawkins in her pursuits and just lovely people or Michael Shannon who's just out to torture this fish man who can say why we don't really know why they're doing what they're doing to this fish creature it's ridiculous but he's so disgustingly evil in a good way which is why you appreciate Michael Shannon as an actor eventually the movie goes along and you know that eventually they're gonna try and get the fish man out but that's really just a minuscule footnote at the end of the movie the movie's just so good in making you believe and support a relationship between two interspecies creatures and believe that their love they share is real. Great in terms of CGI as well, the fish man is absolutely convincingly believable. It's great in terms of the romance, the urgency of the situation. It is one of those movies where not really much happens, but it holds your attention for the whole film. It is an experience. And that's what's great about some movies is that it makes something that is just unique in itself that you won't get in other films. I know I just said Greatest Showman is great because it's like all these other films, but it's great. And Paddington 2 is a lot like family films. The Shape of Water, I don't know if you're going to find something that is like The Shape of Water. It deserves its winning of the best film of 2017 at the Academy Awards. I love it for a number of different reasons, but mainly because it is such, it is a film that reminds me why, yeah, movies are good. And that's why The Shape of Water, number eight. Coming in at number seven, I love Christopher Nolan. And I can guarantee you when we go back through and do the other films, Christopher Nolan films are going to pop up all the time. He released his film Dunkirk in 2017, and it was just great. Dunkirk's thing, obviously, is it is about the evacuation of Dunkirk during World War II. A incredible evacuation that required a whole bunch of moving parts to come together systematically to pull off the evacuation, which they do tremendously. I don't want to say it's a spoil to tell you that Dunkirk succeeds because we are not Nazis. <laughs> we are not fascists. I would like to think we're not. So you know everything's going to work out fine. Christopher Nolan always likes to do something different with his films. He has a unique style, which I think either people roll with or they hate. In Dunkirk, he does an incredible storytelling where he tells three separate stories, each moving at different pace so you've got one story that takes place during a week you've got another that takes place during a day and you've got one story which only takes place during an hour then are all different parts of the escape the week storyline is the soldiers that are waiting to be evacuated from dunkirk the day storyline is is the boats that are coming to rescue the civilian boats i might add these are civilians that went and answered the call to help people in need and the hour story is tom hardy in a plane just providing air support at certain points. Now it doesn't, it's amazing because all the free storylines are going along and you're sort of, you're adjusting to each one and it's, and it's space, but then things start to come together and you realize that they're all intersecting at a certain point and each part of the movie cannot proceed if the other movie, if the other part doesn't provide the support that it needs. And the fact that it can do that without confusing you, absolutely incredible. Of course, even though you know things are going to work out, the suspense is fantastic, you are biting your nails, you're wondering if everybody is going to get there in one place. The music, the tenseness, truly one of Christopher Nolan's great things is he's able to really use music to enforce the urgency of the situation. He has his usual actors that he pulls from and they're all great in here as well. Killian Murphy, Tom Hardy as I said before, but we've also got some new people to the Christopher Nolan world. Mark Rylance, who I love but I only learnt that he is in movies quite recently and he suddenly popped up in a lot of things. He's delightful. And I will say this, Harry Styles was announced to be in this movie. Didn't think much of it. Cynical like I was, I thought he wasn't going to be very good. Harry Styles, actually fantastic in this movie. Well done, Harry Styles. It is a good war movie. It is a good action movie. It is a good showcase of what one can do with movies if you do something different. With The Shape of Water, it's Obviously, the story and the romance of the Fishman with Dunkirk, it's showing how you can tell a story in a variety of different ways and still make it so entertaining, suspenseful, dramatic, fantastic. Dunkirk I knew was going to be good before I saw it. I knew Dunkirk was going to be an experience at the cinema, and I was right. And I immediately purchased Dunkirk afterwards, added it to my collection, rewatch it every couple of months just for a great cinema experience. Dunkirk, number seven. Coming in at number six, now, as I go forward and I watch movies, I start to obviously, I start to recognize directors. You start to get a feel for people. As I just showed you before, 
I love Christopher Nolan films for a specific reason. I love Guillermo del Toro movies for a specific reason. As I've mentioned in the past, I like Quentin Tarantino for other specific reasons. Guy Ritchie for specific reasons. Everybody has a unique feel. One of those directors is Edgar Wright and his film Baby Driver that came out in 2017, obviously, was an absolute showcase of everything that makes Edgar Wright one of the greatest directors I've ever seen because he has a specific style that he brings to his films which is very entertaining. It makes you feel like you're at a show at a theme park but also in a way that he's able to bring a comic bookiness to his films without actually really adapting comics. They're all original ideas with the exception of Scott Pilgrim. Baby Driver is an incredible film that uses music to tell its movie. Everybody reacts and says their lines and does their action based to the soundtrack that's going on behind it. Baby Driver is about Baby, played by Ansel Elgort. That's a real name. He's the best driver in the business for crimes, essentially. He's a good getaway driver. Has a bit of issue with his ears, so when he is driving, he pops his music in, and he just drives along to whatever song he's listening at. And somehow he uses that to escape the police, to pull off daring stunts. And it's not just driving the car as well. When he's out in the real world, he moves along to the music that he's listening to. And it so seamlessly goes along to the story that we're watching that it is, it is again, an incredible experience to watch the movie. Baby Falls for a Girl, played by Lily James. Their romance is so sweet and so lovely. I'm a sucker for that sort of romance in movies. I support them immediately from the moment they lock eyes. It's just great. Not just Ansel Elgort, but Baby Driver is supported by a tremendous oddity of cast. Kevin Spacey is in this movie, unfortunately. We're going to breeze past him. Jamie Foxx. Jamie Foxx is a supporting character in this film. And he also does some great action sequences and moves along to songs in this movie. Specifically, there's a scene set to Tequila, which is just great. You also got John Hamm, Eliza Gonzalez, John Bernthal. Everybody in here is just top-notch at these distinctive characters. No one character is like the other one. But of course, Baby stands head and shoulders above everybody else because of the way he sees the world, because of the way he moves to music, because of the way he just wants to get out of the business, to go live a life with Lily James, which is great. It is a lot of fun, Baby Driver, and it really will have you looking for songs to drive along to yourself. Every single song in here is unique, but you'll add it to your playlist, regardless of what type it is, whether it's jazz, hip-hop, rap. I don't know what other songs are there. I'm not one for music, but every song in Baby Driver, absolutely added to the playlist of songs from movies that I will listen to over and over again. There's always an investment that Edgar Wright puts into his movies, and you can tell with Baby Driver that this was a pet project for him, something he really put a lot of effort into, and it absolutely shows. I love Baby Driver. It is a great movie. It is a great experience as with a lot of these films. Maybe 2017 was the year for experiences at the movies and that is why Baby Driver's number six. Number five, if you know me by now you're probably wondering where are the Marvel movies? Don't worry, here they come. Coming in at number five, Thor Ragnarok. Now people can say that Thor was the weaker of the Marvel trilogy heroes that we were going on out of Iron Man and Captain America. Now I, I personally didn't mind the original Thor People can say it's it, it doesn't fit as well as everything else. Whatever. I'm a big fan of Asgardians and gods and myths and legends and all that stuff. I will, of course, though, absolutely agree. Thor 2, Thor The Dark World, weakest MCU film of them all. It is a bit boring. No one really knew what to do with Thor. No one really knew what to do with Loki. How do you progress further on with the Asgard world when you've got so many other characters? Bit of a letdown. Well, apparently all you needed to make Thor good was have Taika Waititi put his lovely little hands upon Thor Ragnarok. And here we go again. Directors, right? Taika Waititi is a New Zealand gem. He's got a New Zealand humour that is just so wacky and so zany. Now, a lot of people have argued that perhaps it is too much for the Marvel Cinematic Universe because, yes, Thor Ragnarok is probably the silliest of the MCU films that have come out, but it also found... It's striking point for Thor. How does Thor work? Thor and Chris Hemsworth playing Thor is great in a comedic sense. He has great comedic timing. He's really good at being a fish out of water in certain situations. He's got some good observational humor. 
But when the situation calls for it, he grabs his hammer and he jumps up and he saves the day. Thor Ragnarok specifically is Thor is trying to stop his evil uh, enemy Hela from destroying Asgard in the prophesized Ragnarok, obviously. But he ends up on another planet, uh, stuck as a gladiator, where he once again runs into his brother Loki. Turns out the Hulk is also there. He's got to deal with the Hulk being hulkiness on the planet. He's got Jeff Goldblum as the ruler there, being his absolutely Jeff Goldblumness, And he's got to get off and save his people before they're all completely eviscerated. Very serious plot with some really dire circumstances, but at no point do you ever feel scared because the humor just doesn't stop. But it is well-balanced humor. Everybody really finds their stride in Taika Waititi's humor, I think, whether it's Chris Hemsworth, Mark Ruffalo as Bruce Banner the Hulk, Jeff Goldblum's Grandmaster, Tessa Thompson's Valkyrie, Carl Urban's Scourge. Everybody is just really funny in here. No one is trying to be funny and not. It all lands. But what's great about it too is, up top of all of that, it still manages to progress the MCU story. At this point, we're getting up to the Infinity War saga. Thanos is coming. You don't want to be spending a movie that doesn't address anything like that. So it does push everything forward, just in the funnest way possible. And of course, Taika Waititi is in here as well as Korg, who may be the greatest creature that's ever graced the MCU in our lifetime. Korg is a big rock monster, apparently from New Zealand, and his humor is just great. I love quoting him. I'm not going to do it because that might be offensive. Just absolutely incredible. Thor Ragnarok is just so fun to watch every time I can watch it a thousand times in a row. It's probably the most rewatchable of the MCU films, and it is absolutely great at number five. The fact that Thor Ragnarok is only at number five means that the films that are about to come now, our top four, are just stupendous. So buckle yourself in for that. Number four, War for the Planet of the Apes. I hope I don't lose a lot of you. It really frustrates me that I try to recommend the Planet of the Apes movies to people and they just won't have a bar of it because the concept is silly. A future where apes have taken over the world. Yeah, all right. Looking back at the old films in the 60s, apart from the first one, which is taking its place in time for what it's done and its twists and turns, all the other apes films after that, bit stupid. However, the apes trilogy that has come since 2011 with Rise of the Planet of the Apes and the Dawn of the Planet of the Apes and then ending with War is just fantastic movie. Putting aside the apes thing, it is just so well done structurally, emotionally, action, romance intenseness and it all comes down to how we have progressed in time to the point where people doing motion capture can convincingly portray apes that have the tendencies of humans. Andy Serkis has played Caesar since the original Rise of the Planet of the Apes in 2011. This is his third film. It's completing our trilogy of apes films. The first two that came before it are great looking at what makes a human a human, what makes an ape an ape, how we're all capable of terrible things. This one, simply put, Caesar's just trying to lead his apes to live a peaceful life. And the humans are coming back. They want a war. Caesar's want a war. For a series of events, he ends up in a prison. And he's just trying to get out and just escape and save his people in any way possible. It is a powerful movie showcasing just how terrible we are capable of being as humans when we're put in a terrible situation where we have to survive. Action's top-notch. Woody Harrelson is great as the, the colonel villain that they're up against. But at this point, there is a scene in this movie where the apes are off looking for, looking for their quest that they're going on. And they're engaging with this little girl in a cabin. You absolutely forget that these aren't real apes. I know it sounds silly, but these are so believingly portrayed. Whether it's Andy Serkis as Caesar, you've also got his friends Maurice Rocket. Everybody puts 120% into making these apes as believable as possible. Again, it is a movie that just holds your interest. You're mesmerized watching it. And I think everybody feels the same way once they see this film. You just have to get past that original a movie about apes taking over the planet. Uh, I, don't, I don't care. But the apes never want to take over the planet. I will say that specifically. It may be called Planet of the Apes. These apes aren't about to kill all humans and take over the world. They just want to live in peace. And they are so emotionally invested in their family that you absolutely feel for them. 
So of course this completes the trilogy, so I don't want to spoil how the other movies went and how this one ends, but suffice it to say it is a powerful ending that was absolutely satisfying. I love War for the Planet of the Apes, I love my Apes trilogy, I love Caesar, War for the Planet of the Apes. Number four. Number three, as I said before, movies come back around later on that I had not seen, they get added to the list. I guarantee you this movie was not on the list in 2017 because I only saw it a couple of months ago. But my god, it is a good movie, and it's worth talking about. It's three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri. Now again, we're going back to the director's thing. I've recently discovered another director that I love. Apparently I love all directors. Martin McDonough. He does these really good black comedy movies, which are so hilarious in a disturbing way. He's done In Bruges in the past, and he's done Seven Psychopaths. Both, I think, are on my list for the top 100 films of the decade, as is Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. It is a simple premise. Frances McDormand plays a mother whose daughter was killed, her murder has not been solved, and she rents out three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri, which is where she lives, which basically just calls out the local sheriff, played by Woody Harrelson, saying, why haven't you solved it? Do something about it. And that's really the movie. It's just their interplay back and forth. They wanted to take down the billboards. She won't do it. On the same side, you've got Sam Rockwell, who's a deputy, and he's just an asshole. Sam Rockwell might be one of the best actors in the business, and he really proves it in here, playing this unlikable little turd who has moments where you feel bad for him, but then he'll throw someone out a window and you remember he's just a piece of dog shit. Frances McDormand is absolutely lovely. I want to see her in more things. The emotion she portrays is this grieving mother who's still got this wit about her that she's able to fire back. The whole town sort of is against her because they just want to forget about it and move on. They love their sheriff so they don't like that she's saying that he's incompetent or anything. Really, apart from Sam Rockwell's nastiness bits, there's no real villain in this movie. It's just human emotion and trying to move past a tragedy, trying to solve a tragedy. How do people cope with it? How do people react with it? And it's just a delight to behold. It really makes you think how you would react in the situation if someone you loved had been murdered and no one appeared to be doing anything about it. What would you do? Insane. But again, because it's Martin McDonough, there's the black comedy in here. There's moments where you laugh out loud and it's really inappropriate because you shouldn't really be laughing in those certain situations because the subject matter is so serious. It was one of those movies where I, I read the title and I went, okay, I don't know what that is. I'll get to it one day. Going forward from this point, I'm going to try and really look into every movie before I decide I'm not going to see it because I wish I could have gone and seen this movie in the cinemas. I think it would have been a great experience. I loved it when I saw it. I'm still thinking about it to this day. I can't wait to rewatch it. Number three, Three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri. All right, number two. One could argue one and two are a bit interchangeable. One always pulls ahead from number two for a very specific reason. It's called specific bias for a specific genre, however you want to do. But either way, this could also be number one. But number two is Blade Runner 2049. Now, I don't want to anger too many people, but I'm not a huge fan of the original Blade Runner. I think it's good. Ridley Scott did a great job as this future with replicant robots and Harrison Ford is this overwhelmed police officer that's out to get them, Rick Deckard. But there's so much going on in it. It's got addressing so many themes and twists and turns. And because there's so many different copies of Blade Runner and different endings and different interpretations, it's hard to really follow along and know if you're following along. So it's fine, but I'm not about to rewatch Blade Runner every other Friday. So I was a bit overwhelmed to go see this one. I wanted to see it because it's a sequel. It's always nice to see how things have progressed from other movies. It's a two and a half hour movie, I was a bit worried about that. Boy, was I wrong. And again, here we go. It's because of the director, Denis Villeneuve, who you may know has directed films like Arrival and Sicario, which are all fantastic films. He did a tremendous job of taking the theme of Blade Runner, the music, the atmosphere, which is great from the original Blade Runner, applying it to this sequel so it still feels like a Blade Runner sequel, but then making a coherent story with likable characters and an interesting plot mystery. Ryan Gosling plays a Blade Runner. Blade Runners are police officers that hunt replicants that are robots called K. He's a, he's a replicant himself. He's just going about his daily day life and he comes across a dead body. 
And through a series of events from that dead body, it connects back to the original Blade Runner. He starts to find some conspiracies, some mysteries. He's ordered to do things that is against his, his moral code. Harrison Ford comes back into the picture as Rick Deckard from the original film. What I love about this film is the visuals. There are a lot of establishing shots, showcasing radiation in the desert, water against Los Angeles. With the music swelling up when you see these things, it blows your mind away. It looks absolutely real. The other thing I love about this film is Ryan Gosling. Ryan Gosling is a great actor, I think, when he's playing these brooding types. You feel for him watching this movie. You never really learn too much about him, except that he's looking for a connection, which he's not getting because he's shunned for being a replicant. His only relationship he has is with a virtual girl. So as he comes up with these moral dilemmas that he's forced to decide between doing the right thing or doing what his job requires him to do, he somehow conveys this emotion, which he doesn't show on his face, because Ryan Gosling, I don't think, has too many facial movements. But it's just incredible to watch him. You feel for him, you root for him, you want him to get out of every, out of this one piece, and you want him to save the day, to save Harrison Ford and everybody else. The dialogue in here is stupendous. The things everybody says to each other is just so strikingly real. Nothing feels like a cliche line from a script. The, the jobs that people say to each other, the little side notes, tremendous. And the fact that when it cuts from the original Blade Runner to this one, and it feels like the movies came out in the same time, impressive, because Blade Runner came out in the 80s, and you've got this one coming out in 2017, and it all feels like one movie. Fantastic job. It was great at continuing the Blade Runner story without confusing people who had never seen the original Blade Runner. You can watch this movie, not watch Blade Runner, still get what's going on. As a definitive conclusion, so we don't need to have another five or six Blade Runners. Incredible sci-fi film, incredible experience, again, at the movie theaters. Great acting. Blade Runner 2049, number two. All right, before we jump right into number one, as usual, here are our honorable mentions. And as usual, I picked a whole bunch because why not just celebrate movies while we're stuck inside and have nothing to do? The Lego Batman movie. Love Lego humor, love Batman, the combination of the two, great. John Wick, Chapter 2, the over-the-top violence, Keanu Reeves' wacky wick, the world-building of the film, stupendous. Kong, Skull Island, very cool having these Vietnam soldiers go to Skull Island. Kong was great as a character. Samuel Jackson was over-the-top as a villain. Wonderful stuff. T2, Trainspotting. Trainspotting is one of my all-time favorite films, and the sequel that checks in with the characters 20 years later didn't feel like it wasn't needed at all. It seemed completely perfect to the story that they were progressing. Power Rangers, my, I loved Power Rangers when I was a kid. This reboot of the original series that I watched entertained me. People would argue that it's a bit too serious and they didn't become Power Rangers soon enough. I don't care. The moment the Power Rangers theme started playing, I was on board. Guardians of the Galaxy, Volume 2, The Guardians, The Misfits, they're always lovely. Not quite as good as the first one, but Kurt Russell as Ego the Living Planet was just wonderful. Wonder Woman, Gal Gadot proved that you can shake off the grimness of Batman and Superman and make an actual proper DC movie that's both grim but enjoyable. Cars 3, I've mentioned Cars 3 in my top Pixar review movies. Cars 3 is just a wonder to watch. Spider-Man Homecoming, so many Spider-Mans people might have wondered maybe we don't need any more Spider-Mans but because Tom Holland is just absolutely lovely to watch, I love his Spider-Man and I love Spider-Man Homecoming. Coco, great Pixar film, great original Pixar film. Murder on the Orient Express, Love a Good Mystery, Agatha Christie's Poirot, Murder of the Orient Express is obviously her most famous one, and Kenneth Branagh's take on it was fantastic. And finally, Jumanji, Welcome to the Jungle. Dwayne Johnson, Kevin Hart, all of them running around in the jungle in this video game. I love it. I don't know if everyone else did. I thought it was great. All right. Now, we've said our, all our films, we've done our honorable mentions. Let's just stop beating around the bush and say what we all might know what number one is if you're aware of years and movies. If you're not, drum roll please, in your head, not really here. Logan. Yes, I've mentioned Logan before. I've said how Logan was robbed of the Academy Awards. I've said how people, uh, the, the stuffy old people don't understand what Logan is as a movie. Well, I stand by everything I've ever said before. Logan is great because, as I said, I love Hugh Jackman. I love Wolverine. I've watched all the X-Men movies. I've watched him through the bad movies like X-Men Origins. I've watched him through the good movies like Days of Future Past. The idea that they were going to do a Wolverine film based on him as an old man, 
at the end of his life where all his friends have, are dust and gone. And he's given up and he just wants to, he wants to call it quits. Didn't think it would work because I thought they would play it safe and make it PG-13 like the others. But no, they went full R or MA in Australia rating. There's violence, there's swearing, it's gritty, it's rough. There's a sense of Johnny Cash to it, which is great. I mean, Johnny Cash music plays in the in the credits. Essentially, Logan just comes across a young girl called Laura, and he's just got to get her from point A to point B. She's being hunted. Along for the ride, of course, is Patrick Stewart as Professor X, but he is not the Professor X that we remember from the old X-Men movies. He's old, he's senile, his brain's going, he can barely keep his pants on, and he's just an... they hate each other. Xavier and Logan just bicker at each other back and forth. They're just so sick of each other and so sick of life. What makes this movie great is Hugh Jackman's investment in the battle-hardened Logan that we're getting. He looks tired, he looks overwhelmed, his claws come out of his hands and they look rusty and the, the scabs on his fingers as well. He looks like he just wants to give up and he's had enough. But when the situation calls for it, he's there to protect this little girl, Laura, when she needs him. Laura's also great in this movie. She's a little Wolverine, essentially. She's got her own little claws. She can go into full berserker mage and just slice and dice some bad guys in true violence and gore, which is great. There's not too much to talk about the movie, essentially. It is a very simple premise of going from point A to point B, but as it's the character development. And that's what I really like about some movies is when they take the time to delve into a person's character. Who'd have thought that the claw-wielding Hugh Jackman from the original X-Men movies jumping around on the Statue of Liberty would get this own personal character film where you really studied his soul and what he is as a person and how he views the world. I cannot stress on how much I love Logan. I cannot recommend it enough to everybody that I see. It's not just a good superhero movie. It is just a good movie, period. Logan, absolutely number one. And there we are, our top 10 movies of 2017. I hope you enjoyed listening to them. I hope you had some movies on here that you were looking for that I did mention. I hope there's some movies on here that you might consider watching now that I've talked about them. It's been fun. It's been uplifting to talk about them in a certain political climate that we've got going on in terms of what's going on outside. It's easy to be overwhelmed and a bit stressed. But sitting down to talk to you guys and just talk about movies, I don't know, it makes me feel a bit zen. And I hope I can progress that onto you. I hope if anyone else is stressed out there, just taking the time to listen to movies, maybe go away now and watch some movies, just chillax, just everything will blow over. We just got to give it time. But until then, I will keep coming to you. I will keep giving you episodes, maybe not reviewing some movies. I promise one day I will get to one, I swear. But next week, I'll bring you something special. I'll bring you something new. Tune in next week. Look forward to that. But until then, I love and appreciate you as always. You've been spliced in later. Adios, muchachos. I'll catch you next time.